go. My guest today is Thomas Mackey, and he is here to talk about the life of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I'm just curious, why why the interest in Abraham Lincoln in the first place? <laughs> Working in um, museums uh, for really most of my 40 year career, um, you're kind of you, you don't have the luxury like in um, if you go to grad school right away. Uh, to pick your choice and you spend your whole life on own research. In museums, you're, you're given the research because there's an exhibit coming up, there is a, um, an event, there is a, uh, some kind of uh, community activity or the house you're hired to manage, that's your age. So you become these little micro specialties um, again and again and again. Right. Uh, but Lincoln, I got the job. Um, I've been a historian for since 81. Took grad, started my first graduate class in 79. Um, Lincoln was there. I knew him, but um, when I started realized I was going to take this position, I was going to have to specialize in Lincoln, and that began back in Lincoln ever since. And when you're writing, you were told me you're writing this book. And what kind of research do you do when you're writing? And what did what, oh. you know, what you don't know, already know? Well, uh, since it was started in a doctoral program, I had to find something that was fairly new. What I decided to do is, in fact, my advisors looked at me and they said, look, you've got these decades of work in museums. So you're used to public history. You know all these um, elements, how exhibits are put together, how books are put together, you know, public books. Um, could you merge that with the study of Lincoln? And so we looked at together and said, okay, Lincoln actually has even more influence after the man is killed than before. He becomes this... Um, poster child of what it means to be an American. Whether you like it or don't, he's still your poster child. What do you mean by poster child? If you, if you, think, about, well, you think about the, an old term when um, a medical um, need comes up and, they, and, and a series of hospitals or a um, medical association wants to promote you know, um, this particular ailment so they have a picture of a child who has this particular ailment, a poster child. That there's your image. There's your, um, uh, your the image in your mind that you keep in front of everybody. Uh, sympathetic image. This child has um, a heart condition, um, a birth a birth defect that you know they're they're coming with, and you have a picture of this child. We don't, a lot of our hospitals over here will have a poster child or a poster elder, some, you know, and that becomes their marketing piece. Um, if you're gonna market what it means to be an American, whether you like it or don't, uh, whether you're from which party, Lincoln becomes your image. He's your marketing image. Does that make sense? Right, yeah. And I, I think I, I was gonna wait until the end, but I was just, Curious, do you think the Civil War oh. was inevitable, or do you think it was, uh, <laughs> it was coming anyway, with or without Lincoln? Oh. If, um, so my internet's becoming unstable here. Um, if uh, historians always look at contingencies and complex, this means there's always another way. It was, nothing's ever inevitable. However, when you get closer and closer in looking at uh, the narrative, if you look at a vast story of the United States, once you hit really the 1850s, um, unless somebody really gives up entirely on their position, there's no way out of this. Now, even yeah. before we can see, even in the time of Jefferson's administration, 1800, 1808, we're looking at, oh dear, something is not gonna go well here. <laughs> um, even at the Constitutional Convention, there are many who are saying, oh Lordy, this may not make it because they know this is a big issue and we're not resolving it. So they kick the can down the road. They said, well, the next generation, Jefferson himself says, it'll have to be another generation. I can't do it. And then the next generation says, I can't do it. And at each time that happens, more things are compiled and the, rec the, and the um, divisions become more and more pronounced and personal. By 1850, there's already been, you know, three, three or four near civil wars over this. 
or similar things to slavery, but they're regionally divided. So by 1850, there's not much of a way out of this unless somebody completely surrenders their positions. Which was not gonna happen. Yeah, um, the, the compromise of 1850, it just barely makes, it just, I mean, Congress is already, people are fighting in Congress. There's some good books out on this one. I mean, we've had duels. We've had people beaten up, attacked, <laughs> shot at, stabbed in Congress. That's how bad it is. <laughs> Sounds like a circus to me. Yeah, well, yes, yes. That's probably a very accurate statement. <laughs> right, but yeah, let's get into Abraham Lincoln. And uh, we just started mm -hmm. his early life and he was uh, born in 1807. And, uh, 89. Yeah. Yeah, Lincoln's born 89, Kentucky. 89, that's right. But, yep. Um, he is the second child of um, Nancy and um, Thomas Lincoln. Thomas and Nancy come from old settlers. They had been here, their families had been here since the 1600s. Um, most families in early America are interrelated by this time by the time Lincoln's born, the Boones, the Lincolns, they're kin, they're kin. Um, so they had this relationship, they have connected. Um, but uh, Thomas is um, a fairly simple character. He's a hard worker. Um, a lot of his artifacts or his artifacts are still around. You can see them. So you know this guy's skilled. Um, but he doesn't have a lot of ambition. He, he wants to farm. He wants to make furniture. And he has, and he, since he's also part of a, we now call hardshell Baptist culture, um, he really has an opposition to book learning. It is not something you do because if you spend so much time with books and learning, God can never use you. You'll, you'll be proud so, but Lincoln, by very nature, is a bookish kid. He loves learning. Um, all the oral histories, all sorts of people who knew him, that's the one thing they got about this guy, is consistent as his kid will always be reading. Reading was he, because this is an oral culture, you read out loud and you read slowly and you read again and again. So this is how he grew up. And for, so, for someone like us living in today, it seems like, like a natural thing to be. But his father was against slavery. And why, why was he against slavery in, in that time? Like, what made him so against it? There were several churches, like the Quakers and certain Baptists, who were opposed to slavery. Um, depending on the person, some will be on economic because it harmed his wages. Um, it would be suppressed. Um, Thomas moved due to the land issues and, and the slave issues um, that harmed his wages. And he moved to a state like Indiana. One, Indiana was just now getting settled by Americans. Um, there was land that the natives had, had, had been vacated from, they're moving in. And if you're at the beginning of a settled area, you have a better chance of making yourself wealthy. So Lincoln himself said, that, yes, slavery was part of it. It was mostly land titles. He'd lost two, two different major properties um, in Kentucky uh, due to the lousy surveying in Kentucky. It just, it, he couldn't make it, he couldn't make a go of it. Um, so he finally got a hold of some land in Indiana and could stay put for a little longer. And he, and when he sold it, he could make some money off it. Um, but Lincoln said, yeah, the church itself was opposed to slavery. Thomas was probably a little opposed, but not on a moral issue. The ones who are moral issues, this is what would start to irritate and offend the Southerners because that's so ingrained into the political power base of the South that slavery is part of their honor code, it's part of their social system, it's the base of their economic system. And to question it morally, that you cannot be a Christian and be a slaveholder, just 
set them on edge. And when slavery it becomes a moral issue on one side, not the other, the, the compromise is gone. The ability to actually say, well, okay, what? Well, let's give a little, there's no give. Once it's a moral issue, there's no give left. It's just, you know, draw your swords and let's go at it, go at one another. And that's the kind of attitude you see, particularly even exit, maybe even before, depending where you are, even before 1850. So there was sort of a tension before the Civil War in the South and the North. Yes, the tension grows. It's often around slavery, but it's more personal than that. It's not simply an ideal. It becomes a very personal thing. The Virginians, I hate Yankees. They're cold, un unfeeling, ungodly people. They're all a bunch of atheists. Um, and slavery is tied into it, but it's a very co complex ball of wax, a mess, a, mess, a mess here. It's a Gordian knot of issues when you look at it. Um, so when somebody says, well, it's not just about slavery. Well, yeah, but slavery is at the bottom of this mess. You know, it, it's the stink in the, in the, in the, right. um, in the, com in the, com co in the political complex. It's right there. Slavery is still tied into that mess anyway, but it's very personal with many people. And what was his father-son relationship like with, with Mr. <laughs> Mr. Lincoln and his uh, name? That, yeah, that one's a fun one. A lot of historians love playing with that. Um, my personal theory, and I think some others agree with me, that the split between Abraham and his father, in a way, is at its root a religious split. Thomas Lincoln is highly religious, but he's religious in a very... Um, revivalist way. Thomas, born in the um, uh, 1770s, comes into adulthood in some of the, the extremely emotional revivals around 1800. They're explosive, they're um, vast. And so some of the relatives, the relatives talk about Tom and Nancy at a revival service where they're singing and dancing and yelling and screaming. Um, these are highly emotional, and that's the religion that Thomas Lincoln comes with. Abraham is really a pretty shy kid. <laughs> he is not demonstrative. He does not come out and show his feelings. In fact, most people, friends of his, refer to him as the most reserved, um, cloaked individual I've ever known. <laughs> he does not tell you what's close to his heart at all. It is... Um, not his way. And, I, and as you mentioned- and so I have a religion. Go ahead. Yeah. As you mentioned, he, he loves reading. And from what I read, is it true that his stepmother is one, one of those who teaches him to love the mm -hmm. of reading? Well, yeah. Well, if you remember, his birth mother dies when he's about seven years old. So he's awful young when, when she dies. But most American families, frontier families are blended families because somebody's died. <clears throat> um, that's really not unusual. Um, I think we've made too much of it, the death of his mother, because most kids growing up around eight, born 18, nine, have lost one of their parents, maybe two or three times. So, you know, so they've been through this before. But, it's more or less a common practice. But yes, his well. stepmother, yeah, yeah. His stepmother, though, sees Lincoln, and I, some have said that she liked him more than her own kids, because Thomas took on um, one of her boys as his favorite, and then and um, Sarah took on Lincoln uh, Abraham as her favorite. I think um, it's not a good practice, but it, that is something that I think was also commonly done. You have your favorite kid. Uh, I find that appalling, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> being a father of four myself, <laughs> but. Um, yes, so she is the one who brings him in. Um, she outlives him by several years. Um, and she had said in her oral interviews, he read copiously, but, you, but as a young man, he read magazines and journals. He knew the Bible well, because that was the standard book of, that was a standard, you know, language. But he loved politics as a little kid. Um, religion, he mimicked and he mocked a lot. In fact, there was one um, notice of him mimicking a pastor's speech with all the hand motions and expressions. It looked like my daughter. She, you know, 
she, she, my, he was a vicious mimic, you know? Um, and uh, you know, people got after us. You can't do that. Don't you mock the pastor? You know, he found revivalism funny. You think he was more humorous. or less atheist? At first he was, yes. I would say at least agnostic. Uh, there are some documents that he wrote or speeches and poems that are, are really not this edge to him. When you get to the end of his years, particularly in the Civil War, that's when you see a religious personality coming out much more strong. But he's going through a lot of pain. He has lost two kids. Um, his wife is really uh, suffering um, a breakdown. Um, and you know, I mean, he's taking personally the losses in the Civil War. This is something that he personally takes. And people have noticed this. People who knew him back in Springfield know, gee, this guy's gotten old real fast. Um, and those who didn't know him, since the guy never, guy is strangely melancholy and yet he makes jokes. Kind of, it's a split personality. Yeah. A clown. From, from, what know, I clown who, from what I understood that he, he wasn't very liked in the White House because he joked. He then didn't oh, yeah. presidential. Well, think of who's in the White House with him. Now, Edwin Stanton is an Ohio guy, an attorney, and he becomes very close to Lincoln, but he hated the jokes <laughs> because they were frontier jokes. Right. They're the ribald humor popular on the frontier. And he would always slap his uh, hand on the Yeah. Knee, well, he was, he's awkward. He is socially awkward beyond belief. In fact, I had one student who I'm pretty sure um, was in the autism scale and told me later on privately that I'm so glad that Lincoln was awkward like me. He read Lincoln's letters, uh, particularly when he described his, one of his early courtships, which was stunningly inappropriate, awkward, clumsy, beyond belief. <laughs> and we're so glad it's not us. You know? <laughs> right, right. But so, so you realize this guy is awkward. So his humor, his social interaction is awkward. If it's in politics, rock and roll, honey, he can talk with the best of you. If you're talking other things, forget it. <laughs> forget I can, it. I can't try to present <laughs> him on certain parts. I recognize myself. You recognize yourself? <laughs> well, one of my, um, uh, the lady he used to, he tried to court, wrote letters later on. And she said, you know, in all the things that make a guy attractive to a woman he just didn't have. <laughs> he right. couldn't do, you know, conversation, small talk, forget it. <laughs> yeah, I see myself there, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, a lot of us have gone through at least Asia at some oh, point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, then they moved to Illinois. And uh, what yeah. did they, why, did, why did they move to Illinois and from? Well, there, yeah, well, the main th reason, now the family had grown up, Lincoln was adult by this time. But at age 21, he was manumitted. He could leave his father and not have to work for him. How he stayed longer, one, the family decided to move. Another outbreak, what we sometimes call milk sickness, which was um, a disease that cows uh, developed by eating a snake root. Snake root is normally found at the edge of forest and fields. Um, we don't have the problem now. One, milk is pasteurized, but um, this root, if the cows ingest it, contaminates their milk. So it's really quite toxic. It's really, to it's a poison. Um, they don't normally eat this, but um, it's, it's, a nat it's native to Indiana. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's all over the place, um, particularly in the margin areas. And an outbreak of the milk sickness had come about again. Thomas said, okay, we're out of here. We're, we are so out of here. And I think he, the man is like, like a lot of guys in this time period, at least that when, the ones we kind of hear about a lot, um, are a little malcontent. They're not satisfied anywhere. They always think I can do better further on. I can do better. I can get cheap, you know, buy low, sell high. I can, let's try this again. Um, never really satisfied. Uh, he's a hard worker, but not a very smart one <laughs> in, in that way. Um, but he's a good man. This is a good guy. This is not a bad guy. He got us a bad rap from William Herndon, who knew Lincoln hated him, and so he hated him too. 
Um, and a lot of my historians, friends of mine, don't like Herndon at all. Um, I find him an interesting character, but you know, but he's not like his kid. He is not at all like his kid. But you know, so I said, let's move again. This disease is coming back. We're out of here. Some, you know, some relatives had already moved to Illinois. They found land cheap. It's all prairie, um, deep soil. You know, thinking I can do better again. Try it again. So, right. And when, it, when he moved away from his family, he never contacted his father again. And why didn't he, why didn't he think he contacted his family? Uh, in any, and his father, family, and, well, he loved his not father. His family, not his family, but his father, if I'm not mistaken. His father. Right, father. If um, wasn't, if the, since the relationship wasn't that bad, why did he never take contact with him again? And we're breaking, but let me try uh, with that one. Um, there are two powerful forces in this time period in American history, social forces, and they're, they're everywhere and everything. One is politics, the other is religion. The two things you never discuss at Thanksgiving, you know, when you family reunion, uh, at least in my family, it's surely the case. Right. Um, politics ties into religion in, a, in America. Oh, it has. Um, it makes us very unique that way. <laughs> but um, Lincoln rejected his father's religion and he rejected his father's politics. Just before they're moving to Indiana, Lincoln works at a general store in Spencer County. And it is the owner of the store is um, a follower of Henry Clay. Now there's no Whig party yet, but um, people looking back at it will think about Lincoln becoming Whiggish at this point. And that is an idea that the government is there for the good. And it needs, and as a government, it needs to provide what people can't do on their own. Roads, canals, infrastructures, um, support, linkages between the states, linkages between farm and the, the market. Lincoln absor absorbs this politics like nobody. And he is a firm believer in the Whig philosophy of life. Thomas is not. In fact, Lincoln's family never votes for him. <laughs> and they say, oh, we never voted for him. <laughs> um, my family wouldn't vote for me either. So I guess we, we, I, I, could, I can relate to that. But he, um, so he has this very firm belief in, um, he is religiously ambivalent. All right, maybe I could always say, he is ambivalent. He attends church, he is active, but not that active, and he doesn't hold it close to him. It is not a close feeling. Um, and at times he can be an angry young man. He's, um, he, he has a temper, he is somewhat um, hostile at times, and he has a big mouth. And that's gotten him in trouble a number of times um, because he can mimic people and he is opinionated. And um, he gets him, yeah, he gets him in trouble. So those two forces split him from his dad, particularly, who was opposite on both. And imagine Thomas would look at Lincoln going, how did I get this boy? You know, how in the world did I get this boy? Um, yeah, he was there when he was born, but he just doesn't know what to do with his kid. Um, and I think that's part of the thing. But Lincoln does, the rest of his da dad's life, he takes care of him. Now. Lincoln's uh, wife and kids never visit him, as far as we know. There is no indication they ever saw Thomas Lincoln, or Sarah even. Um, so we're pretty sure that's the case, that, that Lincoln separated from his family once he left him. Settled in Illinois, that Ed, when he got debt and in trouble with the law, um, over debts, he made sure that his mother and father had land and they had income. And he was very harsh on his stepbrothers if they at all neglected or if he felt they neglected their parents. He was, his letters could be really harsh if he, you know, um, he would be a tough taskmaster to work for because he is not going to let you off easy. Oh, I can imagine. He is not going to be an easy character to work for. 
But it does, he does try a lot of work before he settled on becoming a law, lawyer. And what kind of work does he do in, before he's uh, down as a lawyer? Well, at first, he works in retail. In Indiana, he's at a shop. And also, while in Indiana, he takes his first trip as a boatman. So I think one of his first desires was to be a pilot, a boat pilot. Now, he, now he took flatboats, which are basically a large raft-like craft with a cabin on top, built on top. And he floated them down the Ohio, Mississippi to New Orleans, taking crops and material down there, and then taking another um, craft on back, or, or you know, basically walking back, um, walking and riding back. Um, he had also uh, made his own boat. So one of the first times he actually made money, changed his mind about things, uh, he made a boat and I think he was trying to decide about what to do with it and you know, maybe do some fishing and maybe make some kind of business. But two gentlemen in, um, in Rock, uh, Rockport, Ohio, or Rockport, Indiana, um, has looked, son, can you take us to that boat halfway out? Because the boats don't have, Ohio River didn't have piers. The boat would stop halfway in the river and people from both sides would take a boat out to uh, um, the steamboat. Steamboats are a fairly new technology. Lincoln rode him out and he says, well, what about my pay? Both gentlemen threw a half dollar at him and Lincoln looked at it later, several times, told himself and told others, wow, I saw that one dollar in my hand. And he says, this is an uneducated farm boy can make a dollar and a half hour is worth of work. Oh, that changed the world because this farming sucked. <laughs> you don't make that kind of money. <laughs> right. That's a lot of work. And I'm not, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, you know, as a young man, probably at 16, 17 years old, that would change how he approaches the world making a living. He takes, uh, of course, he makes money going down the Ohio. He proves himself to be a very tough, hardy individual. You know, any frontiersman, this is not an easy area to live. And he's as good as anybody else in making it in there. Um, in, in Illinois, he does the same thing. He kind of wanders about a bit before settling, um, doing another boat, uh, uh, you know, another boat ride. Um, and he does it through somebody in, in um, New Salem, which is a brand new investment town. People have set up shops in the mill and they're trying to make a commercial site out of this thinking, you know, we got a river right here and we're near some major roads, so we could, this this will make it. Well, there are all sorts of towns that never made it like that. They're at a seemingly a good site, but the river just, just doesn't cut it. You know, it's just not good enough. It's not strong enough and no one's gonna build a canal out there. Uh, but he starts his work there and it's in retail again. But he does a range of, like blacksmithing, surveying, the main job was survey work and a postmaster. Those are important because as a postmaster, this tiny little town, he has free reading material <laughs> and he is known. But having been able to read and write by that age in New Salem, um, at the next election, Lincoln is hired to do to be the poll, uh, the poll taker. He's the one taking names down, recording your vote. Is this where he gets his first taste of politics? Or is it... Yes. Yeah. Now, now he's talked politics already uh, in Indiana, but now he's actually in it, in, in the in, involved in polls. And Lincoln's most of Lincoln's work actually is behind the scenes. He's a poll worker. He's the canvasser. He is a promoter. He is not the front person. He is not the candidate. He's in the back room. Um, and that's what he does. When he's 21, 22, he does, he gets convinced, well, let me run for the legislature, state legislature. This is a simple office. Um, he loses, but not by much. In fact, the people in New Salem, part of his district, you know, they almost all vote for him because they knew him. They know him. Now, again, there's only one political party, the Democrats or the Republicans. There's only one, really isn't a party. We, um, euphemistic. So Lincoln works, you know, in politics. He doesn't get elected at first, um, but he's taking odd jobs. And this is the common thing in this part of the world where they're going to do. You might be 
you might call yourself a politician, but you're really a farmer, a blacksmith, and you're also going to be building furniture or you're going to be um, doing something out the side. So everybody has stocked, stacked jobs. They're all, they're all living in what we call a gig economy, if you know what I mean. Um, hopefully one of those gigs will make it big for them. So it was hard to live out of local politics at that time. It is, and that's, but that's the kind of nature. When, when, when I look, go back to past and I look over what they were doing over the years, it's, it is like being a, in a gig economy. They have to have a number of jobs because no one's going to support them. Uh, most farmers are not just a farmer. And yet no one person, they might be a retailer, but they're also going to be a farmer on the side. You know, the, the farming is your ubiquitous activity. It's everywhere. But... Um, you also have other occupations attached to it. So that's yeah. the world Lincoln lives in. So what made him decide to become a lawyer and start his own, eventually become, start his own law firm? Well, you've got to do something with your life. Lincoln realized uh, when New Salem began to decline and he did start into politics as, an, as a delegate, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which is at Vincennes, Indiana. Um, he had some mentors, other lawyers who said, you know, Lincoln, you're good at reading, writing, you've got a good head on your shoulders, and you've got a really good voice for public speaking. What they mean by this is that Lincoln, being six foot four, had a high-pitched voice, not a deep voice, very high-pitched. Now, he had this, probably had this really strong Kentucky, Indiana dialect. So he had a strong dialect, but his high pitched voice and his big frame, he could speak out in a crowd and be heard. There are no microphones. The world of 1840, 1830 is a quiet world by comparison to our own. There's very little ambient sound of machinery, of air handlers, you know, of all the things that we hear, we forget about. The white noise is not there. But it's important if you're gonna be a public speaker, politician, you have to be heard. Your only real communication is your voice. You're gonna write speeches, yes, but that's only a certain group's gonna read those. And even those are gonna be read out loud. This is an oral culture. People go to speeches just for the fun of it. Terrifying thought, but that's their love. That's, they can, and they get to debate, they get to argue and fight and drink copiously. Um, that's the, the world he's, he's in. And Lincoln had that skill at being able to make fun and his humor developed over the years was very sharp and automatic. So if you insulted Lincoln, you were in danger because he was gonna take you down <laughs> real fast. He had the ability, he was a stand-up comic. All right, he, right. you understand that? He had this ability, yeah. He had this ability to take what somebody said and turn it right around and slam right. you with it. Yeah, um, yeah. In, in our day and age, he might have become a stand-up comic instead of a politician. <laughs> <laughs> because he just had, and he was, I mean, the guy was six foot four, awkwardly built. The night of Comedy um, Central and Rose night, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> he would just be a yeah. He would just be a different kind of character. So, he, but he used that, and he had a self-effacing humor, which was just very disarming. Um, he could also remember what people said. A little like Churchill that way, he could he had memorize um, people's statements and what he had read before, so he could repeat it back. And he had a flawless memory once it was ingrained. It was, he didn't do it fast, but once ingrained, it never left him, which drove him nuts sometimes too, because he couldn't forget some things. So yeah, that brings us to when he becomes a lawyer and then railroad comes, and then they have to defend, why does he have, why does he have to, the, does he choose to defend the railroad company? And what's going on there? Why, what, what's this about? Oh, the, rail, the big trial, uh, Lincoln, besides being, um, an inventive kind of character, but he, Lincoln is a techie as well. He loves or loved technology. Um, and the technology of the age was steam. 
how can we harness steam um, or, me or mechanics and together and make new things? He saw the steamboat. In fact, he piloted a steamboat up the Sangamon uh, to New Salem, attempting to document what size boat can go up the Sangamon River and make it navigable. He had argued many times to clean the rivers out or create canals on the side of the river, you know, basically makes rivers. Railroads are very expensive. But when you get to um, his later years, when he's still an attorney, in fact, the end of one of his last cases he did um, was the uh, Effie Alton case. And it was a debate between the railroad company and a steamboat company between St. Louis and Illinois, or on the St. Louis slide of Illinois, in the Mississippi, but between St. Louis and Illinois, Afton. Um, the rail bridge was there. The steamboat, it made steamboat traffic a little more complex than normal. And it, it pre pretty sure that the steamboat captain del deliberately sabotaged his boat by running it into a pier on the uh, railroad pier. The lawsuit argued that because steamboats had prior use on the Mississippi, their use comes first. Railroads have to give to them. This is an economic issue. Lincoln looked at the two technologies, steamboat and rail line. It became obvious to him that in his case that the rail was the wave of the future, not the steamboat. And the nations, again, this is a wig. The, the nations the linking of the nations, as much as he liked the rivers, as much as he enjoyed steamboat work and boat, you know, river work, what came first was what was going to link the country together better, and steam railroads were that link. Because there was not limited by weather, it was not limited by water source. He had already come to that conclusion um, by the late 1850s. Now, he was still a case, and that was a very big case. He got paid a lot for that one. Um, he worked it a couple of times, but he worked all over the place. He was a very secular lawyer. He had he took cases of all sorts. He he defended a plantation owner to maintain their slaves. I think that kind of offended him. But he's also a legalist. He does not. He's not. He is not an activist in any stretch of the imagination. His religious attitude about slavery against slavery. And in general, will come after the wars, well after the wars start. It's then we really start seeing more and more Lincoln's emotional and religious attachment to, you know, issues. You don't really see this ahead of time. He takes in cases, he doesn't like slavery, but he doesn't like it as a, it's an injustice, but not at that religious moral level where he can't compromise with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which brings us to family and uh, his first name, first love, and Ruth, pretty much has the <laughs> name wrong, and Ruth Lynch. How did they meet yeah. and what's the romance? Uh, he was lousy. Uh, <laughs> uh, the oral histories, um, and I, I, I love oral history because that's what being in public museums, <clears throat> we work with a lot. You have to use them tenderly because they'll lead you astray, but you've got to back them up. Right. There was a suspicion that he had some romantic attachment as a teenager with a young lady in Kentucky. Not a lot going, we don't have much with that one. Anne Rutledge is the one most gotten onto, and a lot of because, thank you, William Herndon, um, who started to research Lincoln because he hated the way he was being portrayed um, by the, the the big press, the the formalized um, biographers. He hated the way that Lincoln was treated as this paragon of evangelical virtue, because he knew no 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 no. The Lincoln he knew just wasn't like that. But he never saw Lincoln again after February of eight, or January eighteen sixty one. He never saw him again. So Lincoln is um, you know it, it changed on him. But anyway. Um, Anne, we know he was connected to Anne. He had, he had um, rented from her father a room at the tavern, or at, the, at their, his place. 
um, there was this wonderful story and tragic by Anne Rutledge's young sister. Now she is, an, or she is a witness to this. They were all having fun because Lincoln and his brothers and, the, and, the, and Anne that are there and in there just clowning around, they broke a bed. And they said, oh, okay, now you, 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 you wrecked the furniture, you gotta fix it. <laughs> you know? And they sent Nancy, this young girl down the road to get a wrench, a certain kind of a bed tightening wrench from um, the Herndon, another Herndon family, Rowan. Well, Rowan was cleaning, preparing for hunting. And as Nancy got in there, the gun went off and it killed his wife. The reason why that's that's important story, Nancy remembered this entire day because of the tragedy that she saw in front of her eyes. She saw Mrs. Herndon accidentally killed. Um, and she remembers the emotional shift from the fun as a little girl she was having watching the big kids just goof around, you know, just having fun together to this tragic moment. All it shows is that Lincoln were, was friends with Anne and her family. It shows that he knew them and they were close as anybody else was close. The Rutledges in their oral histories talk about that they were engaged or they were close to each other. Um, we can't tell if they're engaged except that engagement is normally public. Anne was already engaged, <clears throat> but we can be assured pretty sure yeah, it's, it's reasonable to believe that the right ages might have remembered it as something more than what it was. But they were close. At her death, but her, when she dies, um, this is during a, an epidemic so that other people had died too. Lincoln was working with a lot of families who had died. Ann Rutledge's father died, Ann died, and a bunch of other folks in New Salem died. Lincoln's grief observed at that time is more likely the grief that everybody around me is dead. I've lost a lot of friends. <clears throat> and he was prone uh, to depression. When things are bad, he, you know, he would, he, he would dive off. So, um, you know, there is a problem, you know, he has a problem with that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue he's had. But this is one of the first time we, we notice it in the oral histories that he has really took a dive um, emotionally. Now he's still in the legislature. He doesn't miss any votes. He's still active. When years later, he has his breakup with Mary Todd, then we have a very documented evidence where they're really worried about him uh, because he is really on a nosedive at that point. Has so he hit at this point? Pardon? He has hit rock bottom. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, how, so when she dies, um, how long after does she meet Mary Owens? All right. Um, after she Anne Rutledge. Down his right, right. Yeah, right. Anne Rutledge. Mary Owens, the next one. She's only a couple years later. That's just an awkward relationship. That one <laughs> just definitely happened. And then a few years later, he does meet Mary Todd. Mary Todd being from an affluent Lexington family. Now he falls for her immediately. Everybody knows that, you know, they watch them talking. Now, what's really funny on this one, Mary is very popular. She's attractive. She is political. She is vivacious. She's a flirt. Um, extremely educated and all guys are, are, are flocking around her. She's eligible, very eligible. One of the other guys who's flocking around her and meeting her on the, in the parlor is a guy named Stephen Douglas. You might recognize that name. Stephen is a young attorney about Lincoln's age. He's from New England. He had been trained as a lawyer in Canada, New York. Now he's in Springfield trying to make his mark in the world. And he's up and coming, aggressive young attorney. He has fought with Lincoln a number of times and both Lincoln and Douglas are both courting Mary Todd. I had a wonderful group of, of middle school kids <laughs> and I described that in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, I said, now you remember, Lincoln um, 
Stephen Douglas was his wife's ex-boyfriend. And all the kids went, oh. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh. (laughs) They all knew each other. (laughs) More than you'd want to know. So there was this relationship going on here. So you have to tie this TV drama. Yes, yes. Yeah, there we have it. So now we have this added, this, it makes more sense. Um, so, you know, when Lincoln, some, when um, just before they got married, Lincoln's big mouth got him in trouble. He had written, this is in writing, and he wrote about James Shields, who was a short Irish guy with a bad disposition, really, really ugly disposition, no sense of humor at all. And Lincoln insulted him in the paper that he had he had part ownership of. Lincoln wrote a lot of editorials anonymously, um, a lot of them, and they were scathing. I mean, these are these are hostile little bits of pieces here. Um, it makes some of our politics almost look tame. Okay, that's how hostile it is. Um, so anyway, in that exchange, and Mary helped out, and at the time they they weren't together, they weren't talking to one another. She wrote some as well, because she again, she's a political activist, very much a Whig. And Shame Shield says, that's it. You will not insult me. And he comes stomping up and he writes the letter. This is an honor code. He writes a letter to Lincoln demanding an explanation and satisfaction. Lincoln goes, for what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sore loser. Um, it turns into a duel. Now, Lincoln being challenged knows James Shields is a crack shot with a pistol. He has dueled before. Don't pick pistols. <laughs> he picks cavalry sabers. These are three foot massive swords. And he designs the, um, the, the, the dual ground to be a foot apart. Well, Lincoln's six foot four. James Shields is my height, five foot four. Who's going to win in a duel with long swords? You know? mm-hmm. Shields can't even get near them. <laughs> oh. It's the fight never occurs, but Lincoln is embarrassed that he's gotten himself into something so illegal. But everybody knows it. Everybody knows all the young people, you know, thought, all those in their phones. They all know they're all there. You know? <laughs> So years and years later, as president, a soldier went up to Lincoln. He had heard this rumor. He says, Mr. President, were you in a duel? You know, kind of an honor. Wow. He goes, son, if you appreciate my friendship, you will never bring that up again. (laughs) Do not talk about that. (laughs) But I I read somewhere, I don't remember where, but that Mary had bipolar. What do you think about this? Ah. It, it, I've heard it from the state, and I'm, and I'm inclined to think possible, except the one problem we have is that the oral history we have mostly on her comes from after 1850. Mary is on medication. Now she's had a, she's had, as president, when, when she is the first lady, there was an attempted assassination against Lincoln by, a, by his carriage was sabotaged. Mary falls out of the carriage, really hits her head hard. She's nearly killed. Um, but she has had uh, other emotional illness, other emotional upheavals. And I think she has the same tendency toward depression Abraham has. But she is taking laudanum, laudanum, and it's got mercury in it. So she's taking poisons, basically. And that could exacerbate the mood swings that maybe a slight case of bipolar or depression is going to exacerbate. It's going to be worse than normally would be. Right. There is no medications, remember, for, for any, even the mood swings, you know, there is, there is nothing available unless you, you know, treat yourself without, with whiskey or laudanum or something else that will, that will have worse consequences down the road. Um, she, but those who know her earlier on, she is precise. She is educated. She speaks to at least two, possibly three languages. Um, being fluent in French, she is capable of uh, being the first lady or a diplomat's wife because she can 
speak the court language of all Europe. You know, the international language of diplomacy is French. She speaks it fluently. So she is in that, that world she already. Because she inter- has one of the key components. She was a very intelligent Yes. Woman. Oh, extremely. Extreme. Oh, she, I would say a graduate level education um, coming into the 19th century. She is extremely precise and educated. Um, the mental illness she suffers, it's hard to say, bipolar has been, has been a favorite of a lot of, even those who you know think about psychology, yeah, that's possible, that's possible. Um, but it's made worse by other medical conditions, injuries and depressions that she has suffered with through anyway. And frankly, I don't think Abraham was a great husband to deal with. I think he was a very hard person to live with. Um, he right. is not demonstrative of emotions. Mary would need that. He is not easy to deal with. He is opinionated. Uh, and he's gone. He spends the, the entire 1840s, most 1850s, away from her on the circuit. He loves the circuit. He loves the hard life, the camaraderie of the guys, um, the ribald jokes, and the fighting in court. He loves this. He absolutely relishes this. Uh, um, he's a political animal. There's not a campaign he didn't like. <laughs> you know, if he wasn't running, he was running for somebody else. It's not until we get to 1850s, I think he feels the seriousness of what he's going to do. And, but I, I do think get, that's active. The dude for, for okay. children, and from what I, again, from what I read, they, he seemed to be very affectionate to these children. And what is their relationship, is, especially if he's gone for so many years, what is their relationship mm-hmm. like with the kids and the fam- kids growing up? Because not all of them grow up, do they? No, only one does. Uh, just die young. The boy, um, Eddie dies first. He's about three or four years old. Uh, Willie is dies in the White House as a preteen, and Tad dies after Abraham, but he dies at about age sixteen or seventeen. Um, his older son, Robert Todd, uh, lives on till his late his old age. And he is a very successful, prominent fat cat businessman. He's a lawyer. He's an ambassador to Russia. He is a renowned personality. And he's also the, he was also the guardian of his father's image throughout his life. Um, he has a whole other wonderful story just by itself. I think Abraham would have not been, dis, not been happy with him because he turned out to be a very dark individual in many ways, very cold um, and not involved. Lincoln had grown, of course, by the Civil War, he had grown to hate slavery and he loved um, capitalism in the way that he said, everybody needs a chance up. He believed in that, okay, there's this farmer, whether it be black or white or native or Chinese, he believed that farmer needed the opportunity to eat their own bread that they made. Um, even start to see elements that Lincoln may have had more of a women's rights, not, not like we think of it, but that they are pe- people, as citizens in their own self. They have agency. You know, the woman does not have agency in politics. He thinks, I think they should because I think he knows I can't, you know, you can't depend on the husband to care for her anyway. Um, there was this wonderful story where apparently Lincoln um, at a bad case, a wife was being beaten by her husband, and apparently um, he and some friends got the husband, tied him to a tree, and gave his wife a bat <laughs> or a large stick. He says, go ahead, beat him back, <laughs> and very quietly told him, don't you ever hit your wife again, Right. or much worse will happen to you. So there's this other side to Lincoln that doesn't show up in a lot of biographies. Some of the good ones do. They're in oral histories, and they're, oral histories are very dangerous because, boy, you got to use them carefully. So you've realized, okay, that's an oral. That obviously, yeah, it's not something, and, and, and that kind of event is not something you write about. You don't, you don't record it. You know? right. <laughs> but he had a sense of, so it would indicate to me that there was a sense of justice, that there were enough times, we see these enough times that he is 
an angry character, he will not tolerate an injustice to somebody else. And I think that part I could grasp and I can, all right, yes. And if there may sometimes he might have been physically harsh on somebody because they were unjust to someone else. I can believe that. But he looked at it as fair. Yeah, what is fair? And he wanted government, the court to insist this, if, if, if this is unfair, I'm going to fix it. And we see it that in, in, in the, how he approached the presidency, this is wrong. I don't, don't care if you think I should not do it. If something is wrong, then, and he would create an argument. He would construct documents, the Declaration of Constitution. So you could follow, again, he's an attorney. He's not an activist. He has to form an argument, but boy, sucker's gonna be bent. He's gonna, he's gonna bend common law a lot, but he's going to do something. He will not let something be undone which is why I think it's so valuable that Lincoln is paired with activists like Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, a former slave, he is, he is every bit Lincoln's equal in public speaking. These two have to go together and they make the changes in the world. Douglass is an activist, Lincoln the legalist. Together, they make the changes. Right, so when, when the join the house, this is a top register to that when the politic era. So when does he join the House of Representatives? Okay, he was in the House of the Delegates in the Illinois House, I think four or five terms. I can't remember. He only served one term as Congress. Illinois is a very Democrat run state. There is only one district where Lincoln lived where Whigs even had a remote chance of getting an office. And they took turns. They simply, all the Whigs said, okay, on uh, this term, you're going to go. And the next term, you're going to go. You know, that just took turns. So is nobody like was going to serve more than one term. Is it still like this today or is it different now? Uh, Illinois is highly Republican, um, except for the northern part is very Democrat. But remember, the party switched between 1860, 1890, and 1970 you see a multiple of switches in affiliations where the wings of the party begin to shear off and go different directions. Right. And what's left is by 1980, you have a very conservative Republican and a very progressive Democrat. Um, then we seem to have lost the wings, <laughs> you know, they, they kind of ideologically pulled further aside. That's what we're still facing that now. In fact, that's what's making our, hist our current politics and some of my colleagues jumping into the political sphere because, you know, they can see what's happened. You can trace that a pretty place. Right. And uh, yeah, that's true. Much, but he highlighted the issue of slavery and uh, what, how does he highlight the issue? All right. Slavery is, a, is where, in fact, um, Edna Medford, a friend of mine at Howard, Dr. Edna Medford at Howard University has done some great work on this one. Uh, she studies black history a lot extensively, but Dr. Medford um, had brought out the fact that Lincoln has this, this legalist hatred of slavery inherited through his father's time. Um, it's an injustice, all right? It may not be a moral wrong, but doggone it, this isn't right, you know? And there is an image burned in his head, as he said. And he goes back to his old buddy, Joshua Speed. And in this letter, we have this letter, wonderful letter that describes this view and it's changed in Lincoln's mind. He saw a group of slaves and they were all tied together by chains, like so many fish on a trot line, as Lincoln said. And yet these people had found some happiness by singing work songs, folk songs, they were joking. And what caught Lincoln's mind, because he was going through some very serious depression at this time, was that God seems to give even the people with the worst conditions, greater happiness so they can make their lives somewhat tolerable. But those of us pointing to himself 
with all the advantages, and he thought of himself as having advantages, um, great misery to keep us humble, you know. <laughs> he kind of kind of philosophical about this. Right. But that image as he saw burned in his head later on, years later. And it became one that is angered him. When he we think of his argument that be careful because you could become a slave. Um, Lincoln argues that is it skin color? Does skin color make us a slave or free? Then be careful because somebody with a lighter color skin than you can enslave you. And we think, again, this is a bit of oral history and this document that Lincoln wrote looks back at a piece of oral history, is oral history that he saw a slave and, and if you were looking at color codes, you know, who's a slave, who's not a slave? And he thought she put on a block. And that moment apparently slaps Lincoln like a cold wash rag that, oh my gosh, there is no difference between us. If it's only a car, there's no difference. It's absurd. That's when things are going, wait a minute. This is, this is, you know. So Lincoln, unlike some scholars who said Lincoln never changes, I, I deny that. Lincoln changes. He evolves. He shifts. He is not the same person in 1865 he was in 1859 or 1840 or 1830. None of us are. Lincoln particularly so. He makes shifts. He looks at circumstances. I don't know if he lived age 70. I don't know. But he grows. And I think that's part of the, part of the thing we need to look at that. And I think that's an important part of studying Lincoln. Because so much of those documents and oral histories are there to kind of see, wait a minute. That's how he's come across this. He's shifted positions. He has grown further. He's grown from having an animosity about an injustice to having a moral injustice to think, okay, I'm going to do something and I'm going to create some way of doing it. I don't, not sure yet, but I'm going to create my way to doing this. Um, and that is the neat thing we see in studying this guy's life. Right. But what was the Kansas and Nebraska debate? Okay. That's, his, that's Stephen Douglas again. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas is the premier uh, senator uh, in the U.S. Senate at this time period. Henry Clay had, uh, was dying in 1850, and he helped kind of fashion together the compromise. The trouble is the compromise had so many components that so many people can't vote with that it would keep being turned down. So it was, he was dying. So Stephen, uh, Henry Clay is set to die. He's basically die, dying. And Stephen Douglas is, comes up as a Democrat. And he says, okay, I think I can fix this. And he takes the 1850 compromise, breaks it up into components. Everybody vote on part one. Okay, it passes, take it away. Everybody vote on part two, you know, <laughs> put it away, okay. And the whole thing is then put back together again and passes. Um, that way, the senator who could not vote on something that was pro-slavery can vote on part one, but against part two and three, it still passes. That makes sense? I now, think so, yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Stephen Douglas, who went through all that to keep that together, decides we need the railroad from coast to coast. California is growing. There's gold there. We got to pull this together. So... But he wants a railroad that's going to go through Illinois. <laughs> the Southerners say, oh, no, no, no. If we're going to have a railroad, it's going to be through Texas, or it's going to be through the southern part. Well, he's got to horse trade, as we say. And part of the horse trade, he goes, OK, I'll tell you what. Let's let the railroad go where I want it to go, from Chicago to San Francisco, all right? However, let's go ahead and change the Missouri Compromise, the Air Compromises. And what we'll do is we'll open all Western territory for slavery. If you can make a living with your slaves in Nebraska or Kansas or Iowa or other territories, you can do it. 
Now, what that does, it begins opening up areas north of Mason-Dixon line, north of um, the parallel at, uh, at the um, 20th, or at the at, at, at Common Basin 20. Um, all those previous compromises get put out. Douglas' name goes down in infamy because it destroyed all the compromises. And all of a sudden, the North, which have been very ambivalent about slavery, they're no longer ambivalent. By 1853, they are ticked, hostile, and mean. Because the, um, the intensity of the slave codes, or particularly the, um, um, the allowance of posses to go from Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, into states of Wisconsin or Michigan, for example, to capture or run away. And they are and they can go in there and draft you. So if I, I grew up in Michigan, for example, and a posse could come up to Lake Orion, where I grew up, and they could draft me to catch um, African Americans who would run away. And I'd be drafted into the posse to look for them. If I don't, I could be jailed and fi or fined and jailed. Michigan, Ohio, Northern Ohio, New York, uh, Wisconsin, these folks are just not going to have it. And they just get ticked off. In fact, they actually um, start capturing posses that come up there um, and they help run away. So they become militant. They become anti-slave um, because they so much hate this act. And when Stephen Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act, which said all territories can be open to slavery if they wish, no matter where they are, no matter where, then that means slavery begins to move into areas that were not ever supposed to have slaves. The areas that had been banned prior to that one, long before that. And then I'll go on, you know, when you add to that, the, um, the Dred Scott case. Now, um, Taney made the ruling and he wrote the majority report in such a way that says, no, Congress can't stop slavery from going anywhere. So the Kansas Nebraska Act on top of the Dred Scott decision opens the United States to slavery in all parts. Now, you listen, if you reread Lincoln's House divided speech. There you have it. You cannot survive half free, half free, half slave. He already knew it was going to happen. You're going to be one or the other. You better decide. And that's the division made. Douglas did not grasp that. Douglas simply said, we'll just go on as we've always gone on. Our democracy is safe. We don't have to worry about it. This side will be slave. This will be free. fine. Nothing to worry about. He could not have been more wrong. I was going to say that. <laughs> he was epically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. But that brings us to the 1854 election. We're going to touch a little more on the Dred Scott case a little bit. Right, later. right. I hit that one earlier because yeah. it fit with, it, it fit <laughs> with the it's movement of slavery. Yeah, but that brings us actually to the 1856 campaign and the chances, right. uh, for the chances I've had states. So right. Tell me a little bit about this 1856. All right. Let me try to walk. I'll try and walk this through. Um, it's a tough. This is a tough bit of politics here. <laughs> All right. 1852 with the Kansas Nebraska Act. Douglas is not up for election yet, but the other Senate seat is in 54. 56. Now, this is important. The Whig Party by 1850 52 is dying. They are hemorrhaging members or leaving. We have new parties, free soil, barn burners, abolitionist parties. And they're, they are the third, they're, they're shattering pieces of the Whig party. Then we have the really biggie, the American party, also known as the Know Nothings. This is a nativist party. This party's platform, we need to cut off immigration. We don't need immigrants here. There's Everybody's illegal. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> um, my students, I posted the, the uh, Know Nothing platform 
And my students screamed out, it's the Republicans. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> but the know nothings um, attracted anti slave Whigs because the Whig party was ambivalent about slavery. They simply would not make the step because the Whig leadership on a nationwide level knew to be a nationwide party, we have to not not talk about slavery. Mm. We keep that quiet. Well, when you get to Kansas, Nebraska, they're not being quiet. All right, so a lot of Whigs simply leave um, the Whig party, join the know nothings, simply because I hate slavery. And at least the know nothings, even though they're nativist, they don't like Catholics, they don't like Jews, they don't like blacks, they don't like immigrants. Um, they, um, that's, that's their particular platform. At least they're not pro-slave. So they're joining, they're holding their noses and joining an offensive party. The Republicans are coming out of the same movement, but they're starting in Wisconsin and then in Michigan and they're forming, I think in Wisconsin, the party's formed in Michigan that's named um, and it's composed of a lot of old Whigs, but what's particularly unique of the Republicans, there's a lot of Democrats coming over. These are Northern Democrats who have had up to here with slavery, with being bullied by the slave um, politicians. I said, that's it. These are aggressive, militant, anti-slave Democrats, and they're joining this party in big numbers. They're forming, they're, they're putting together. You have anti-slavers in Massachusetts, in New York, Michigan, Wisconsin, they're joining together. They're calling themselves Republicans. 54, they're just starting to coalesce, and the Senate race comes up. Lincoln wants to run. He is not selected but he's campaigning in 54. In 56, Lincoln is not running, but he's campaigning. Here he campaigns for John C. Fremont, the first Republican candidate for president. Here is the more important moment. An oral history, very few know, but you know, pick this, that's kind of a neat one though. Lincoln attends, he goes back to get this. He goes back to New Salem area, Petersburg, Illinois. These are the same people who 20 years earlier had cheered for him, supported him, helped him when he was bankrupt. I mean, these are his best friends. 1856, I think it's in uh, September. He attends his event and one of his um, students, his young attorney reading for it with him is our, is our witness here. He said, he drove up and this crowd is nasty. <laughs> they are screaming at Lincoln, Ooh. yelling, no black Republican will ever speak here. They are throwing things at his carriage. They so, are, go ahead. So what the, what makes a change in mind about Lincoln from supporting him to hating him? That's, so. <laughs> it's a long story. They hate him here and it breaks his heart. He speaks, but these are his friends and they're turning away from him. Do, 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 do. 30 years later, no joke, 30 years later, the same crowd and their kids and grandkids are saying Lincoln was the best of us. <laughs> he was the most wonderful God given man. That's <laughs> so kind of what? <laughs> it sounds kind of what Lincoln's fame. Oh, stunningly, but Lincoln's fame, and that's us, Lincoln's fame is because he had the good fortune, I use that word very loosely, to be killed in office. He is murdered in public at that one very small moment when he is the most popular. It's the week Lee has surrendered. This unforgivably bad war, which has cost an incredible number of lives, particularly percentage-wise in our, our society, has um, suddenly about to end. For the first time in four years, people can see what's happening. 
Lincoln. And there are parades all over Washington, D.C. They're all over the country. Lincoln and Liberty, too. That song, you know, they're re-singing Lincoln's praises for that few moments a politician might know when they're actually popular <laughs> in that area. That's the night he's murdered. Oh. He's murdered in public at a theater. Everybody is watching. This is in front of the world as far as they can do. Telegraph is new. Telegraph is sending out messages throughout the world, throughout the planet. You know, the, the telegraph operations are so, you know, even between the UK, we're starting to see the ability to get instant messages. Lincoln is murdered on Friday night. No joke, on Saturday morning, hundreds of miles away in Canada, New York. Shots. Yeah, there's shock. A young girl, Karen Kells Richards, goes out, and by Saturday morning, about before noon, she is looking around. She's out for a walk, and everybody has already got black armbands on. They're wearing uh, black rosettes in memory of the murdered president. And she's written in her diary that next day. And her grandfather, Sermon, is already prepared. It's Easter. <laughs> you know, this is Easter week. So the religious tone, the emotional political tone, the loss, everything is snowballing emotionally for the country, even harder than Kennedy's assassination. It was on TV. Harder, as, at least as hard as the 9-11 attacks. This slammed everybody emotionally. And that experience, universal experience, and the funerals, and of course the Republicans made use of that at Lincoln's funeral, um, put Lincoln's name. And then you see the next generation, uh, the kids who were little kids during the Civil War, they see this and they see their parents' grief and they see everybody else's grief and they absorb that. And when they hit their majority years in the 1890s, that is when Lincoln commemoration blows. So is that when you get to the statue in the 1890s? That's when you get to the statues. That is the age of statues. It is the, it is the kids of the Civil War generation who build the statues. And they take the emotions of their childhood in a sense. I'm kind of speaking a little broadly, but in a sense, like it's like they take the emotions of childhood, because we see it, we see it in Teddy Roosevelt, for example, and they bring it out in commemorations. Right. And yeah, that's really you don't even go a little more back in time now, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna <Yeah>. roll. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, please. Uh, we <clears throat> You mentioned this briefly, but let's elaborate more on the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. Okay. A little bit. That is the case. Um, it's been, well, in law, if traditional, traditionally, if a um, slave is taken in the North, they're supposed to become free because there's no slavery there. England, now it's important, the Somerset case in England is part of this, this is common law. Back in 1774, 73, the Somerset case decided that anyone bringing a slave into the United Kingdom, the slave cannot breathe free air. Therefore, all slaves are free upon entering the United Kingdom. You cannot, you know, if you're a slave before, once you land at Portsmouth or Glasgow, you are then free once you get off that line, once you, once you step off, you are free. Now, that's a part of law that the English had set up. And that's known. That's a known bit of law. <clears throat> the English then have banned slavery throughout the empire. The United States has withheld that. They have fought that. They have held back. Um, they're supposed to be on the banning of the African slave trade, but there have been a hypocrisy there that they still secretly treat with that. Um, Lincoln administration hammers down on that one, closing that off forever. Um, so, you know, this, this, you know it's, it's, it's kind of a part, I'm losing track of my train of thought here. Um, uh, give me back on trot here. <laughs> the, dread, the, the Dred Scott. Dred Scott, okay. Yeah. The Dred Scott case 
um, was that uh, was the opposite direction. It was trying to push U.S. law completely in another direction. The Judge Taney was arguing, and he constructed a very a very long majority ruling that says, "Look, not only is he still a slave, because he cannot be a citizen because he's African, he can never be a citizen. Therefore, he has no standing. He cannot make a case. He is not human." He's a property. He is a pup. He is just he's just a property. English common law and American common law treats property in an almost religious tone. In fact, if you're looking for the native religion, that it's property, you know. Um, that's you know, I, I look back and I see that as kind of high. So Tani is going back to that. He is treating it as a property. You cannot change that ever. And he's trying to end the debate about slavery by saying. Look, I don't care who you are, what you think, big, fat, hairy deal. They're slaves and slaves forever. If they're just one sixth or the one eighth, I get one eighth of the rule, um, an African, they are African. They are a slave. End of discussion. I don't care what the skin color is. <clears throat> if one eighth of the, if they have out of the um, eight great grandparents is black, they are black. They're slave. It's, that's it. Um, so that's a very strong case. I mean, and he says the constitution and the federal government has no power to limit slavery anywhere in the United States because it is property, even though a particular source of property, you can go from Virginia or New Orleans and you can start farming in Wisconsin, although I'm not quite sure why you would. <laughs> um, it's a different world altogether. <laughs> um, you can still be a, that slave is still a slave. And the state has no power to limit it. And Congress has no power to limit it. Lincoln said, uh, one or the other, which is it going to be? And Tani is saying it's going to be all slave. You can limit it. You cannot like it. That's too bad. Slave property is sacred. The only thing really sacred is property. Therefore, that will always be protected. That's the only thing they would protect or enforce. That case, now, James Buchanan, the president at the time, we think probably agreed with that one and was going to promote that. That sets basically everything on edge. I mean, the Kansas Nebraska Act started the Civil War in Kansas. There was already fighting um, in Kansas already. There were acts of terror, John Brown's raid, John Brown was raiding, you know, there's already homegrown terrorism. There's, there is this, you know, there's already blood in the streets already, right? There are riots throughout the North. There's been, um, posses have been attacked. And in, the, in Congress, there are fights already breaking out. I mean, they are, they are um, it, it's, it's, it, it's been hostile. But now it's a real, you know, three ring circus or two wings. When you have two houses, it's a two wing circus, I guess. You know, so you already have this kind of visual hostility coming out. Um, Lincoln makes a statement. He's, he's the legalist. He says, this is a bad case with bad precedent on bad um, logic. However, we have to follow it. Lincoln's a legalist, he's not an activist ever. Not until so many lives are at stake that he has to make that choice. Again, Lincoln needs an activist to come alongside him, to push him. Then Lincoln will come up, then Lincoln will construct the legal argument so that once he acts, and even Douglas knew this, that he, that if Lincoln had de denied slavery immediately, <clears throat> it would simply go back over. He knew that Lincoln had the skills to kill slavery forever. You had to bury it in a mountain of legislation that cannot be undone. That's the one thing Lincoln knew to do and do well. He understood that part. But the, but the, 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 um, the case you're referring to, <clears throat> um, Dred Scott with Sanford, um, that was designed to end the slavery debate. But what it ended up doing, it made it even worse. It made the, it just went on from the, the um, Kansas Nebraska Act and made the entire issue 
um, in the north untenable. They would not live with that one. And they became hostile. And when the north decided that it was willing to fight to stop this, that's for their rights. Civil war is very, I think, very much inevitable. Because at that point, obviously, no one is giving away. The problem and the, the, the war part comes in because it is sectionally divided. Do you think we that, have go ahead. Do, do you think that the Dred Scott case was a trigger case in the one point for civil war? Repeat that again. What kind of do case? You think that the Dred Scott case was this, was the trigger. Oh for for oh. it's another there are many triggers, I think. I think Kansas, Nebraska. Um there is the long, the long trigger going from beginning to this point where we have a division over what it means to be an American, um, what the government can or can't do. Slavery is um, part of that trigger. Uh, I think Kansas, Nebraska is more of a trigger than Dred Scott. Dred Scott just makes it worse. Uh, Kansas, Nebraska actually starts fighting. That's when the violence actually starts. Um, Dred Scott tried to settle it, but I think what it ended up doing, it hardened the attitudes in Northern states that they were no longer willing. And in fact, because certainly after that, you have the, um, um, the John Brown case with Harper's Ferry. And even though, yeah, he's a terrorist, you have to, he has been executed. Southerners execute him in treason to Virginia. Northerners actually honored him. They actually put up, you know, posters in honoring uh, uh, John Brown. Southerners saw this. And now Southerners, now even going back to 1830, there are Southerners uh, like Rhett um, in uh, South Carolina who said, we should never have been part of the United States. We should never have signed the Constitution. We have no business being with these people. So there's Southerners from the 1820s and 30s who've been demanding secession, but they're in minority. Now we get to um, this, the uh, John Brown raid. Southerners who might be very mild are terrified of their world being taken over um, by the North. Um, and they're being pulled in, into the, you know, this is emotional politics. There's nothing even remotely mild about this. This is very emotional politics. Ration has long gone out the window. And the ability to compromise over it even longer ago than that. We've been able to kind of cobble together compromises, but they're not there. They're not really effective. Um, it's probably at the worst possible moment because the balance is, um, so many states will divide off that will make the war long, but just, just few enough that Lincoln realizes we just might be able to win this. <laughs> but there, there's enough states that will keep this going on. It, it could go on forever. I mean, we could, we could have had a civil war that lasted for generations. Lincoln knew this. Lincoln knew in an inaugural speech, you can't divide a nation up. Where do you put the line? You know, this is not like a divorce. I get the house, you get the kids. You, know, you can't right. do that <laughs> here. Um, he, said, he uses that illustration. He says, we're stuck to each other, you know. And he, and in his mind, I'm pretty sure he could see, all right, do we? where's the line going to go on the Mississippi? Uh, we're not going to let it go. So there's going to be a fight over who gets what territory all the way to California. And it's going to be a fight all the way out there. And we're going to have forts from, from, um, from Sacramento, California, all the way to Washington, D.C. There's going to be forts. D.C. is in Virginia. Where, how are you going to, you know, in Maryland, both those states, wow. both those states want to <laughs> secede. Um, Lincoln says, you can't have the capital. I'm not going to be the one. And I said, I'm not going to be the one to give it up. I got news for you. You better kill me first because I'm not giving this up. And in his inaugural speech, this is where you start seeing the steel come out. Um, he says, okay, if you want to divide, that's your choice. I'm going to have to respond because my only obligation, my pledge 
is to hold it together. I've got no power to let it go. If every state decides to, to go, that's different. But as long as some of the states are decide, no, we are together, I have no, I must hold it together. And that's my, as, as my, that's my vow made in heaven, he says. I can, cannot let go. And that should have been a clue. <laughs> he says, okay, if you do this, it's going to be ugly because he is never going to let you go. Right. I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. Sometimes. Slavery. Oh, yeah. No, it's not. I think Slavery my wife is big. This, oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, one, how's yeah. it now? Yeah, better. Yeah. You're breaking up a little bit in the last. Yeah. But yeah, yeah just no. the same way back and forth here. But yeah. slavery is huge. But at the beginning of the war, Lincoln says, I'm going to leave that out. Again, being an attorney, he knows to argue one point only. Don't, don't, don't get too big. Just, just give me this one little point. And union. And he says, I can get everybody behind the union. Because I have to hold on to Maryland, Delaware, um, Kentucky, and Missouri. Now, Missouri, I'm not sure he ever held on to that at all. But Kentucky was way too important. It's a big state, <clears throat> and it's on the Ohio. And he knows he cannot lose that state at first. So he does a lot of compromises, a lot of what Northerners, anti militia say, boy, this guy's a weakling. Oh, for pity's sakes, you know. He has to hold on to Kentucky. Again, but that's part of Lincoln's, you know, early background. He's from Kentucky. He knows him. He knows, though, if he attempts to go to Kentucky himself, he'll be killed. He knows the hostility toward him, but he also knows that there's enough pro unionist to hold it. It's not going to be pretty. So he knows this is going to be bad. He, I mean, he's, I'm sure he said he knows these people. He grew up with them. Uh, he knows Southern Illinois is, is pro Southern. He knows Southern Indiana is very pro-Southern, um, which is why I think he maintains his status as a, um, in the colonization society. He says, look, we need to emancipate slaves and need to get them out of here. We've got to pay for their route and have them resettle in a new location. I think because Lincoln simply did not believe we had the wherewithal to be a multiracial country. I says, I don't think it's in us. I thought he's a bit of a pessimist. Um, but Douglas, see, so here you get Douglas saying, we were here longer than you were. <laughs> Dude, we have families going back to 1619. You know? right. <laughs> Don't give me this crap. Yeah. Don't give me this crap. We were here before you even. You know, um, We have every right because we were here. doesn't matter how we got here. But we have the right. It's our right. And you cannot say, you know, we have to go somewhere else. You're stuck. You're going to have to get used to this. And it's like Fred, like people like Douglas, Stephen Douglas, or Frederick Douglas, that would make Lincoln push further to the progressive side um, to make his actions um, that there needs to be multiracial justice. It would take a while. It's it's not easy for him. He's coming out of the night. He's coming out of a, a very racist background. He has to evolve a long ways in order to make that move. And I think it's the blacks in his life, the barber who took care of him uh, regularly because he, he wanted a friend, you know, friend of his, he brought him in, gave him a job with him, um, who will die of, um, oh goodness, um, an epidemic that Lincoln had, a smallpox. Um, Lincoln was all right, he survived it, but his barber was killed, died doing it. Um, Elizabeth Keckley was his wife's um, seamstress. She's a very precise person. She's a very educated person. And so these are contacts that Lincoln would have had from 1861 to 1865. And that would change, th those are inf influences that would, I believe, change the personality, the change, that's what person, but the change him to push his, um, his ideas further than what he might have normally had. Right. And I think that's, uh, I don't know if you want to end it there or do you want to, do you have anything more you want to add? However, you've got another question. <laughs> you got the road and it's dangerous. Yeah. 
<laughs> and yeah, I'm, I, I'm kind of been a, well, I've always been a fan of alpine, alternative history. So I just want to ask before we before we end the podcast, what do you think would happen if uh, he never been shot, if he never been assassinated? Do you think he would have been run for a second term and won, or do you think he would have changed the United States? Well, he ran the second. Well, he, remember uh, he won a second term. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna break it there. Okay. Lincoln won his second term. Um, the, the general he had so much troubles with McClellan ran against him. And from September 64 up to September 64, he was pretty sure he was going to lose. Even though Grant was better than the others, he could do it. They were still bogged down. They could not, even after the victories of 63, they could not seem to make an end of it. So he was assuming he was done. And he has a memo signed by the cabinet, unseen memo, signed by the cabinet, that what they would do if Lincoln lost, they were going to have to push as hard as they could for all the Union troops to push the Confederates and find a defensible position wherever they were. Because as soon as the war, as soon as he went out of power, he knew McClellan was going to end the war. They were going to have to have a, um, a, a peace treaty. And there's going to be two countries, but he wanted to at least to have it as the best possible position, you know, to control the Ohio River. To, you know, he wanted to make sure that their troops were in good positions. Um, it's Sherman's march to the sea, or Sherman's take of Atlanta, and then march to the sea that ended everything. Lincoln knew, ah, now I've got it, and that what gave him the victory. So he had the victory. He, there was a peace treaty, I think it's now, I think in February, no, February, March, February, I think, February, I'm going to have March, um, Hampton Roads peace treaty, I remember the dates, terrible of me, <laughs> shame on me, I don't remember my dates, uh, but about that point in the spring there, and now Lincoln knew this was never going to work, it was never going to work, um, but he agreed to meet with them, but Lincoln at the same time was pushing to go beyond the Emancipation Proclamation to the 13th Amendment, which would end slavery nationwide permanently forever. Again, he is an attorney. He's in all these little previous motions. He cannot do more, and he knows that all of those can be undone if the war is ended uh, peaceful, or if the war ends now, or if the war ends at any time, if I don't have an amendment to the Constitution that clearly states Slavery is no, no longer an allowed economic system in this country. Right. But he what, knows. But what, what do you think would happen if he never been assassinated? Okay. In, yeah, yeah, I had to get to that point. I had, I had to wave, right. walk away up there. I'm, I'm walking away. I'm walking in there. Think about conditions. Lincoln's killed. And Johnson, who was a Southerner, Johnson was not Lincoln's buddy. He was not picked by Lincoln, but... They figured the Republicans assumed we needed a Southerner to help pull the country back together again. Johnson is an ardent racist. He hates the planter class, but he doesn't like Northerners any better than they did. Johnson opposes Lincoln's reform movements. He opposes any, any concept of black suffrage. He opposes any social changes due to the war. He just wants to punish the Southern slaveholders and make things more equal for them. Johnson was a Democrat. He was not a Republican. He ran a foul of them immediately. Now, the difference would have had Lincoln, what, this would have been a very hard administration. It is likely that Lincoln would have kept the military in there a little longer early on and not tolerated uh, the formation of the white of the, the night riders. Lincoln would have that would have been completely he'd have, he'd have been on that immediately. I think I think that would have been a he was no you're not mm -mm, mm -mm. so he probably would have enforced this more. Um, he was he did believe in letting him up easily, but he would not have tolerated uh, disobedience. He would not have tolerated a second war breaking out that simply would not have been gone on. I think Reconstruction would still be a nightmare. But if Grant came right after Lincoln, Lincoln might have had time to set it up a little easier. Lincoln, though, would not have become a hero. 
you'd have probably left, you know, in a positive image, but not like a hero. Now, some theorize that Lincoln had, was already ill by this time. And there's some evidence to back that up. If he was sick, he might have died in office still. And Johnson taken over. And Johnson, Johnson was a disaster. I, I, I can't. I know that there's a, some people I know who love Johnson. They're Tennesseans. They love Johnson, but the guy's a disaster. I'm sorry. <laughs> he does not, he is not equipped to do this. He's in the wrong place, the wrong time. And his ideals are wrong. He's also um, a, a, not a compromiser. He does not grasp. He's not a political animal. Lincoln was a political animal. He knew how to run politics. He knew how to twist arms. He knew how to, you know, he knew all he knew all the tricks of the trade. So he understood that much better than, than Johnson in managing this. But um, it would have still been a very hard challenge. Putting this country back together again is going to be a heartache. I mean, that's no matter who who was in that spot, it's that Johnson was probably even worse than anybody else could have been to go in that spot. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that's covers most of what in a quick history lesson and, uh, <laughs> quick <huh? laughs> but yeah do you have anything you wish to promote anything you any social media where people can find well, you um, i do um, i i follow a group of twitter historians on twitter a lot these are scholars from all over all the world too um and they're a wonderful bunch discussing politics and current events and social history uh, it's a fun bunch to follow. And actually, I've seen so many more like Heather Cox Richardson and, um, you know, doing and uh, 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 doing podcasts, talking to everybody. Um, uh, the National Council of Public, National Council of History Education, uh, History Matters, and so does Coffee with Joanne Friedman from Harvard, you know, from Yale, excuse me, Harvard, Yale. <laughs> you know, uh, she is uh, talking a lot about this, you know, her research. So this is fun because now people can get online and watch these university scholars, read some really, really renowned ones um, that I just kind of, oh, wow, I got, it's a free class. <laughs> Sign right, me up yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so I watch these folks. This is the research. My own, because of where I came in from, I'm doing a book, I'm finishing a book on Lincoln's legacy. But since Lincoln is so utterly overdone, <laughs> I had to pick one that dealt with museums. Since my background originally was in museums, I am putting together, rewriting my dissertation to be a book, more of a pop book on the formation of museums around Lincoln. What I found is that the American museum, the public museum movement, you know, local history movements um, are really tied to Lincoln because we don't do this before that. We don't do modern history much. We, we don't. You know, it's not something we, we think of as history. When we get past the Civil War and we look at Lincoln, there's that, again, that poster child idea. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing um, communities setting. Well, you know, Lincoln actually had a house here somewhere, you know, <laughs> and they start commemorating this. Tourism becomes big. And, I, and what I realized is that when people in rural Kentucky or Indiana, Illinois, when they thought of museum, for, for everybody, you know, a, a popular museum. Um, not like um, an elite museum of our fine art and Egyptian things. No, when you think of a museum for the common man, common people, they're going back to um, this dime museum. They're looking at you know, P.T. Barnum, the American Museum. They're looking at uh, the Eden Musée, which you see in Chicago or New York. So when the, when the boosters who made Lincoln Museums thought of, I want a museum here, what's on their mind is a commercial museum. And that's what we see in all of the early Lincoln sites. And I think that is part of America's unique museum community. If you study museums in Europe through Museum Next Association or um, other um, you know, British and European museums, um, you know, I see a lot fewer that commercial sense there. American museums have this, it's like having an awkward uncle in your back, your family that no one really wants to talk about too much because yeah. he was really colorful. And that's part of the us, that's part of the American museum movement, particularly the public ones, 
is this commercial dime museum element. Um, a lot of our, you know, museums still, even that to now, say, well, why can't we have a commercial museum? Why can't it be um, a for-profit? Well, that usually doesn't work. You don't realize why it doesn't work, but people don't grasp that one. But um, we have this temptation that it should simply be funded by um, gate tickets and tourism and um, and buying, you know, rubber, rubber snakes in the gift shop. And that's not the case. Museums require, but you know, part of our and I, I read and I realized studying Lincoln because I found 80 some museums de dealt with Lincoln around the United States. 80. That's historic sites. These are collections. Nowhere near where Lincoln ever lived, but there were collections assembled by somebody who really liked Lincoln and donated them to a university or to a club. Um, and it's a new Lincoln Museum. And so they're all over the country, uh, but they tended to toward this, um, this commercial side. Now, yeah. something, some actually were more shrines and said, but you have this mixture of things, so. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 that's, that's in a gist, um, so but it's, it's a history uh, of the museum movement. What is the book coming out? Uh, right now it's called Shrines and Circuses, uh, History of Lincoln Museums. That's a working title. Uh, my dissertation was titled um, A Shrine for President Lincoln, Analysis of Lincoln Museums and Historic Sites, 1865 to 2015. Um, I am bringing it up to 2020 um, since this administration has added a lot of color <laughs> uh, to our world and to the history and to the how we use history. So I am bringing up that's 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 a lot of the work right now is um, I'm cleaning up things that you know I don't want research language in this. I don't want the you know you don't want no one wants to read a dissertation. Those are awful. <laughs> but you want to you know so you want to rethink this through. Write it now so that it's in my voice, not not a committee. Dissertations are often by a committee. And so now it's, you know, and in fact, my advisor says, Tom, put the stories back, put all the, the little anecdotes you had back, you know, <laughs> those are fun, <laughs> you know. Right. So, you know, we're putting, you know, we're putting the anecdotes back, we're putting things in a little more re readable. It's going to be longer. Um, they told me they don't want to read a dissertation more than 200 pages. And I was grateful since my advisor's dissertation was 800 pages, and I just didn't want to try that. But this is going to be longer because I really have to bring it up and I have to do more, um, you know, bring the stories out a little more, you know, flesh out some of the, um, uh, and I think it make it more meaningful when you look at the stories of some museum founders, how people felt, how Lincoln's um, um, had two types of views of him, people who adored him and would think of him as a godly paragon of virtue. And then you had the locals who said, you're kidding, really? No, <laughs> you wanna you wanna heard that story you told me, you know. <laughs> you know, so you realize you have guy with multiple personalities, not a disorder, but he has different sides. And in the Victorian age, they didn't have that ability. Biographers, you know, was were always don't speak ill of the dead. But we're you know, but if you look at some of the Lincoln museums, they spoke ill, but they also spoke few funny. Says, this guy's funny. This guy's hysterical. You know, he does some really awkward things. You know? Right. And and you see that split in the museum world, the difficulty in showing the two halves of anybody's personality. Um, or at least three or four halves, maybe they're more. You know, we're multi-layered agents of ourselves. So um, this is. It, but this looks at, it's taken that, that difficulty that museums have had in uh, showing that off. And sometimes the exaggerated parts here, the exaggerated parts there. And I play with that one. And I hit some of my favorite museums now that are, I think are, are doing a marvelous job in showing this guy as a complex, wonderfully colorful character that we need to explore. We need to discuss because he does represent the United States so much better than most ca single characters you could find. Right. And he's a wonderful starting point for discussions in other areas. And he's one of the most iconic presidents in the history. Oh, yeah. Well, well. Uh, well one of my students was in London you know, years ago. And she is bebopping around Westminster, just kind of looking around, you know, she, you know, um, 
American girl in London, <laughs> you're just kind of wandering about, and she stops, squawks, grabs her camera phone, and takes a picture. And there is Abraham Lincoln, the St. God statue in Westminster, <laughs> in London. <laughs> She was not expecting this, and I right, yeah, and I missed it myself. My last time I was there, I knew, I figured it was there, but I'm, um, I'm always going, you know, I'm going for the ancient stuff. I'm not worried about the Victorian. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> I'm going to Westminster Hall. I'm on my way to the Roman ruins or something. I'm not right, interested yeah. in that. <laughs> and there's but, Nixon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, not, sorry, not Nixon. I'm in Lincoln, not Nixon. Yeah, yeah, Lin yeah. Lin <laughs> Lin <laughs> Let me say, yeah. But yeah, but yeah uh, so those, those are yeah sorry about this uh, so, so but, the iconic image um when i taught at uh, lincoln memorial university um uh, i worked there as an administrator um the japanese came we had a japanese exchange and they were always knew lincoln they already knew him well they had trouble pronouncing his name um, japanese have a really rough time with l's um that's not one of their favorite letters <laughs> in the hey. english language <laughs> <laughs> But um, that is, you know, it's been a fun thing. Um, but you know, they knew Lincoln already. So um, he is a fascinating character. He is, he is one that if you really want to grasp the nature of the United States and how it would shift from a slave society to a non-slave society. And we look at the various types of, you know, argument, what they call the American arguments. These are core things that Americans have never agreed on. They've never unified on ever, and their Lincoln represents a lot of those. He helps us grasp. Okay, why do we have a part of the country which wants virtually no government at all, and others that want to see it as a positive force? You know, how do we have a unifying multiracial society, and then we have this highly racist society? How do you guys do this? <laughs> how right. do you form yeah. it? Lincoln is a wonderful vehicle. Uh, for somebody outside the United States to grasp, oh, now I understand you better now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't like you anymore, but I still understand you better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a ton of relatable too, in a way. Well, he's very relatable. I mean, um, I, I look at I look, um, my family in Scotland. Um, I, I was as a kid, I always wanted to be an I always wanted to be a medievalist. But I was terrible in, in Latin. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, so I said, I'm stuck being an Americanist. <laughs> yeah, but it's, gonna, um, that was right. I'm afraid. Maybe that was almost two hours now, I think. <laughs> I don't oh, my to... God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's, fine, that's fine. Oh, my goodness, yes. I don't want to waste yeah, your is... time. So, yeah. Uh, uh, well, that, this is some serious editing here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, this is going to be as long as this. I, I promise you not. I'm not going to cut anything. But yeah, this is Bill Well That Age 12. If you want to find us on social media, we are on Instagram. And we can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podcast okay. and Anchor. So if you like this episode, please like, share, and subscribe. Next week, we will <laughs> take this to the next <laughs> level. And we will talk about the civil war in depth. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. This is Bill Well That Age 12. My name is Alan. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.